Hi everyone, welcome back for the next week's worth of exploring the layers of the Hebrew Bible. This week specifically Torah, meaning teaching, law, instruction. First came the layer of creation, and then the election of a family that would eventually become known as the chosen people. Um, but they had no organized religion. They were ex-slaves in the um, wilderness on their way to what they had been told was the promised land. They had received no specific commandments until at Mount Sinai they began to move beyond election to a highly organized way of life, creation, election, and then Torah. Thanks to my friend, uh, Rabbi Avi Olitsky, I am in the sanctuary just a mile down the highway from Breck at Bethel Synagogue, which is a conservative Jewish synagogue of about 1,200 households or more. Conservative Jews treasure the traditions of Judaism, but they embrace the modern world. Compared to the Orthodox, who view Revelation as the primary authority for Jewish practice and belief, the conservatives follow the ongoing consensus through the generations as authoritative. Bethel is the home of many Breck families, and I have been lucky enough to be here on many occasions for bar mitzvahs, funerals, and high holidays, which we are just coming to the tail end of as I film. This platform here in the synagogue is called the Bima, and the pulpit, which I'm going to show you in just a second, is intentionally large enough to hold a Torah scroll. There's the pulpit right there. You see that reading desk? I'll take the camera over right there. It's intentionally large enough to hold the order of service. In fact, they just had a funeral and uh, also a Torah scroll. The uh, niche in back behind me is where the scrolls are kept covered in beautiful fabric and carried through the congregation in procession. People will kiss their prayer shawls and then touch the shawl to the margin or the handle of the scroll in reverence rather than worship. The scrolls themselves are treated with tenderness and great respect, containing writing that stands for the presence of God. They are handwritten on real sheepskin. But our unit this week is not just about the scrolls of the Torah. As Professor Kugel explains so well, the word Torah is shorthand for all the ways in which a Jew should honor God in daily life, mostly behavior, but some belief as well. The Torah, refers to the books, the five books of Moses, although plenty of my Jewish friends call the whole Bible Torah, even though technically the whole Hebrew Bible ought to be called something else, for example, the Bible or the Tanakh, or um, actually the word Tanakh is an acronym. Um, it means Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, specifically law, prophets, and writings. But I have learned not to correct my Jewish students on this point, which is a very small and technical one. Torah is the way of God and the ancestors. It's not just part one of that really important book. By the way, I know many older Jews who are so used to hearing the Bible called the Old Testament that they're not insulted by the term. They don't hear old as in unimproved or obsolete or previous. It's just the way that Christians don't realize they're insulting the Jewish Bible. But younger people are less patient with Christians like us, acting like their scripture is outdated because ours has got the old and the new. And so they are grateful when I call the Old Testament the Hebrew Bible, and when I use the term BCE, before the Common Era, instead of before Christ. It's a little thing, but it conveys respect and hospitality. There's some other shades of meaning um, of the word Torah. The Torah can be um, divided into two different kinds of uh, writing. Um, one of them is law, 
the list of laws, the sort of what you might call rules and regulations, how to keep kosher. And the other is lore, L-O-R-E, um, as in folklore, as in stories. And in uh, Hebrew, these are called halacha, which means law, and Haggadah, which means um, lore or stories. And my um, professor in uh, seminary, John Levinson, the professor of Jewish studies, used to joke that if you had a Boston accent, you couldn't tell the difference between lore and lore because they both were pronounced the same way. Most of what I'm going to be talking about in this lecture is uh, the stories, the specific five books of Moses. Um, Genesis, the first one of those five, let's review, is epic narratives. The stories from primeval time and the ones that concern our matriarchs and patriarchs, the ancestors of Hebrew slaves in Egypt. Exodus, the second book, um, is about the leader of those slaves, Moses, who would bring God's chosen people with a new covenant, a covenant also known as the Torah, to the land of promise. The first half of Exodus is about them. The second half of Exodus is about the Ark of the Covenant, and here we mean Ark as in dwelling, not Ark, the boat, where God's presence would most intensely abide. Third book in the Torah, the Pentateuch, is called Leviticus, and it's all priest stuff. And it's not as boring as everybody says. If you kind of get into it, it's about the temple, how it's built, about rituals, about purity, and it's kind of an inside look um, if you're an altar guild kind of person, you might enjoy it. If you're uh, an anthropology kind of person and you want to know about the um, specific rituals of purity of other cultures, it's, a, it's actually quite interesting. The fourth book is Numbers, which continues some of that same uh, material, but also is about the end of the 40 years wandering in the desert. And finally, Deuteronomy, which in Greek means the second law, is... Um, we think the scroll that Josiah, King Josiah, discovered, dusted off, and used to start reforms in the year 621 BCE. It includes three speeches by Moses before he dies, warning the children of Israel not to intermarry with Canaanites, not to worship the Canaanite gods, and with Moses telling them to centralize everything in a single temple to keep things consistent, and that that temple would be a permanent replacement for what they'd been using for their 40 years of wandering, which was this tent of meeting. Now, I'm going to ask you to um, pause this lecture in a second and go back to the Moodle page and look for the document that I've marked JEPD chart. It's a PDF. So you can pause now and uh, when you're ready, push play and I'll still be here. All right, if you look at this document, if it doesn't like break your eyes, um, you will see that it describes the Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, um, surely as um, not written by Moses. For example, he couldn't have described his own death. He couldn't have described some of the urban details of life uh, that would come true in the future, but it wasn't true yet. Now, if you really wanna nerd out with this chart, you can see chapter by chapter, who the modern scholars think was most likely the author and or editors, besides obviously Moses in the first place. So the yellow chapters are written by the priestly writer. The pink chapters are written by the one named J, uh, which stands for Jehovah or Yahweh, and so on. At the bottom of the chart, in really fine print, so I recommend you use Command Plus a few times, um, you will see descriptions of the style and the interests of each of the five. Now, if you don't want to nerd out and spend some time uh, looking at this chart, that's great. Uh, I'm moving on. Otherwise, if you're curious, just hit pause again and um, notice the two creation stories in yellow and pink. See how the final editor, the gray person, combined two or three different views to make the whole Abraham story. And notice the light blue work um, of the prophet Jeremiah, maybe it's by him, his faithful secretary Baruch, who uh, did a sweeping rewrite quite a while later. 
I have to confess that I find this stuff really interesting. Um, but I also need to warn you um, from experience that um, this almost never helps you in a sermon. I have never um, known a good enough reason in a sermon to go off on a sidetrack to explain why this or that author maybe at the time or maybe later could have written this and that source criticism tells scholars that a diversity of authors, blah, blah, blah. It just, um, unless there's a specific pastoral reason why you want this in a sermon, because it uh, somehow enlightens what you feel that the Spirit is saying to God's people, I would say it's better to save J, E, P, D, and R for a Bible study. But that's just me. All right, I'm back. I want to talk now a little bit more specifically uh, about Moses, because without Moses, there would be no Torah. He is the main character, even when he's off stage and not speaking, even when his death is being described. He's the main character. Moses, for us, for Christians, is important for a reason that Jews never would have thought of. Just like Moses, Jesus narrowly escaped infanticide by a cruel dictator. Um, Moses parts the water, Jesus walks on the water. But in both cases, they have this power over water, or God has this power through their actions um, that nobody else seems to. And water, you'll remember from the first lecture, was there before the creation. It was maybe the great rival of God, or maybe the great raw material of God, especially if you think about evolution and where all of us creatures started out long ago. Um, both of them spend 40 days kind of on their own with God. In one case, um, it's uh, Moses on the top of the mountain meeting God face to face. In Jesus' case, it was Jesus wrestling with temptation and trying to make sense of who he was to be if he really was the Messiah. The other, I guess, a parallel I would make is that while Moses was the author of the Old Covenant in its final form, um, Jesus becomes the author of the New Covenant. Another thing to say about Moses uh, comes from Islam. It's interesting to note that Moses is the most frequently mentioned prophet in the Quran. He's mentioned over 500 times. Um, my favorite Moses story in the Quran is not in the Bible because um, the Quran came along a couple thousand years later. So the story is this. Um, Muhammad has a dream in which, uh, which is utterly realistic, and he described it as more than a dream, that he went to Jerusalem on the back of a winged steed and that he ascended from the Temple Mount into heaven, that he met various prophets, Jesus Elijah, Mary, Adam and Eve, all these prophets. And in particular, he came right to the edge of where God was and received a kind of acclamation or ordination or verification that his revelation that he'd been getting from the angel Gabriel was true. So on his way back down, Moses says something along the lines of, hey, uh, how to go with God? And Muhammad says, oh, really well. I have the five pillars of the faith. And, and um, Moses says, yeah, I, I bet he uh, told you how many times people should pray every day. And Muhammad said, yeah, 50 times a day. And Moses said, no, you, <laughs> no, you've got to go back and bargain with him. You've got to get that number down. Nobody, I, I managed to get him down to three. You've, you've got to bargain him down. And so, in fact, Muhammad did that and took Moses' advice, and it was much more practical to require people to pray five times a day than 50. And uh, so Moses is considered um, in Islam to be not just an important prophet, but kind of a verifier of Muhammad's um, revelation that he received from God. The um, last thing I want to say about Moses is that in the Bible, he's the first of the prophets, and um, he's also one of the uh, only ones to see God face to face. He, and 
he makes it very clear to people that if you're a regular person, you dare not even attempt to look at God, to hear God, or even to be in God's presence. And as we've seen, like with Job, um, that um, restriction goes on for quite a long time. All right, the next um, section is not so much about the main character of the Torah, which is either Moses or God, depending on whether you're um, reading it one way or another. But um, the, the next section is about keeping the teachings of the Torah. Now, at first, the Torah was part of a deal. Um, and the deal was, if you keep these rules, if you follow these customs and statutes, I will protect you. I will continue being your God. Um, it was the latest covenant, following covenants with Adam and Eve, covenant with Noah, and later a covenant with Abraham that gets updated a couple times as events progress. Now, covenant, as you may know, is a legal agreement between a superior and an inferior, and it's got promises in it to be kept by both sides. You worship me, I will protect you. When both sides failed to keep up their end of the deal, the deal did not, however, dissolve like covenants could. Instead, God stayed in relationship with the people and they more or less followed his teachings. Now, the specific terms of the covenant are pretty exhaustive. And the beginning of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, those first ten mitzvot or um, commandments, are pretty clear. But they're not totally clear. Modern criticism shows that it's impossible to know whether the Exodus list or the Deuteronomy list of the Ten Commandments is older. And that assumes that when something's older, it's better, uh, or it's more original, or it's more accurate, or maybe it's what God really meant or what Moses really told people. Um, interestingly, Jews and Anglicans, Lutherans, Orthodox Christians, and Samaritans all have slightly different numberings, but they always come up with 10 because after all, it says there were 10 on those two tablets. Now, the huge number of these teachings and the total is traditionally um, held to be 613. The huge number could be a burden or a blessing. Every time you do something the right way, say the rabbis, you are praying even if you aren't in the temple or synagogue. So if you avoid pork, or you um, take a ritual bath before going to the synagogue on the, um, on the Sabbath, or you separate meat and milk, and you have maybe two refrigerators in your kitchen, or you have two dishwashers in your kitchen, that's prayer. Just the act of following those things is prayer. If you stay within your house on the Sabbath, or you don't go to work on the Sabbath, even though you have so much to do, that's prayer. So it doesn't matter in Jewish law um, whether you're doing these things in the temple or the synagogue. If you aren't sure what you should do, you go ask a priest. In the future, however, there weren't going to be any priests. And so what begins to take shape is something called the Oral Torah. Now, the Oral Torah, and here's uh, a chart, is not scripture, but centuries of rabbis have thought things through and their debates are written down. God's advice for Jews keeps flowing. Uh, it doesn't just stop with the official uh, five books of Moses. So new books get recorded to um, transcribe all this oral transmission. Uh, there are books known as the Mishnah, the Midrash, the Gemara, the Talmud. Christians know almost nothing about these books. And so it would be good for you to have a few friends who are rabbis and go to their Bible study. It's actually really interesting. You would be most welcome. Uh, they wouldn't be as surprised to see you as you might think. And uh, you can learn something about these works and you can even read them. They're all available online. Now, the teachings themselves, the oral and the written, are a pretty mixed bag. Some of them surely come from Mount Sinai. But a bunch of them, such as in Exodus 21, 22, and 23, might be, as you may have read in Professor Kugel's book, they might be imports from Hammurabi, uh, 
in an earlier time, far to the east. Hammurabi ruled a much more urbane people than the wandering slaves that Moses led could possibly have been. They didn't know really about uh, life in town and about merchants and about lawsuits and um, things that assume that you live in a city. Finally, I just want to reiterate, there are 613 commandments, including some commandments that are now obsolete like the ones about owning slaves, like all the commandments concerning the temple. And now, courtesy of Judaism 101, the website, here they all are. So the Torah says the penalty for adultery, if there are two witnesses, is stoning. And the Pharisees, um, who are, after all, experts in following the Torah, bring that famous adulterous woman in John 8 before Jesus. And they've got a Torah question for him, a halakha, a law question. So this is what Moses says, and you seem to be all loose about some of these Mosaic laws. What do we do? Well. Jesus knew perfectly well that even if he said they, that she should be stoned to death, they couldn't do it because the Romans would prohibit the Jews from um, executing somebody, uh, using the death penalty on somebody. So he instead turned the question around on them with a question more about the spirit of the law and the dangers of judging with his famous, let you who is without sin cast the first stone. I'm, uh, I've moved, by the way, I'm sitting in the, the lobby of the uh, Chapel of the Holy Spirit, the narthex. Um, let's take a look at, um, at Jesus's time and how Torah was regarded by people in Jesus's time. Um, as you know, there are different factions or sects in Judaism at that time. There were the Pharisees, which was a strict puritanical um, sect. They followed all 613 commandments. They hoped to bring the future Messiah when the Jews would show that they were worthy, which they were not at that point. They took the original holiness code from the Torah in Leviticus, and they said this should apply to all adults, not just the priests and the members of the tribe of Levi. And to give them credit, a hundred years later, when Judaism was practically destroyed, it was only the Pharisees who were still around. The second group at the time were the Sadducees, the party of the elite, the rulers, the priests, and those who were close to the Roman occupiers. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the body at the end of time, like all the other groups did, and they were also not as strict in observing Torah. If a lot of Episcopalians were around at the time, I think we would have thought the Sadducees were pretty familiar to us. They weren't extremists. They were somewhat religious, but they didn't sort of overdo it. They were uh, among the best educated and the most wealthy of the Jews. Now, speaking of extremists, the third group is the Essenes. They believed only extreme self-denial from food, wealth, even family relationships would bring the Messiah. They lived in the wilderness, segregated by gender, and they prayed for the end of the world. And it's possible, some people say, that John the Baptist wasn't a scene for a time. They were very strict observers of Torah. And then there were the zealots, the freedom fighters or 
the terrorists, depending on whether you were for them or against them. Their target was the only good Roman is a dead Roman. And they used secrecy, terror, and fearlessness in the face of torture and death. Most of them ended up being crucified, many died in battle, and after the year 135, when there was yet one more rebellion, uh, there were no zealots left. They selectively observed the Torah as they seemed uh, to see fit. And then the final group of Jews at the time of Jesus were those who followed him, the followers of what was called the Way, and maybe a hundred years later they started calling themselves Christians. Um, these folks were at the beginning, all of them Jewish, but rather quickly, especially with the mission of Paul and Barnabas and Timothy and others, they were Greek, uh, although sometimes they were just Greek-speaking Jews, but they included Gentiles. Among the Jews, though, at this time, they pursued a strictly nonviolent resistance to Roman rule. They were more permissive about the laws of, Ju of Judaism. They were known for spiritual healings, and they were um, unusual in that they were open to new members from many races, nations, and religion, um, as long as they had um, the belief that their rabbi, their leader, had been, in fact, God in human form, the Messiah, or in Greek, the Christ. The first century of the Common Era saw our religion appear, but it was also the time when Judaism lost its focus and developed a new one. In 70 of the Common Era, Rome utterly destroyed the city of Jerusalem and Herod's huge temple and almost destroyed the religion. The siege of Jerusalem may have resulted in as many as one million dead, residents and refugees from the surrounding country. It was a catastrophe worse than the Babylonian captivity when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the previous temple. After the destruction of Herod's temple in the year 70, the Romans made sure that the city would be uninhabitable. So how do you have a religion with no place to worship? The Torah said the temple had to be right there. Well, what the rabbis, the Pharisees, did to reinvent um, the religion was to reinvent worship. Physical sacrifices would be replaced by prayers and spiritual sacrifices. And Torah became the incarnate word of God, just as for our ancestors, the risen Christ took on that role. In their new Greek-inspired synagogues, they began rituals of venerating the Torah scrolls and remembering what was once done on the altar in the city of David. In my opinion, early Christians did a similar thing in describing Jesus' death as a sacrifice and in remembering and spiritualizing it. The bread of the Eucharist became the body of Christ. And the rabbis did another wise thing. The oral Torah, the growing body of interpretations and updates, was kept alive as a tradition. To me, this is something like the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Christianity. In both cases, God inspires faithful people to figure out how to follow the right path based on what they had learned from the Torah for Jews, or from Jesus, for Christians. The written Torah does not tell you to wash your hands before meals, but that became part of the oral Torah. The Gospels don't tell you to make the sign of the cross to remind you of God's presence, but that became part of the Christian tradition. The oral Torah for Jews expanded on the five books. The oral Torah was accepted by the Pharisees but not the Sadducees, not the Zealots, or the Essenes, or for that matter, the Jesus people. Not for the Samaritans up north either. Eventually, the Oral Torah would get written down, and the Pharisees, who by then, and I'm talking about maybe 200 to 300 years in the Common Era, um, the Pharisees were all the remaining Jews. The Pharisees, they kept on following the teachings as their prized treasure. The Sadducees died out or intermarried and stopped being Jews altogether. The Zealots were imprisoned, crucified, hunted down, or gave up the fight. The Essenes, waiting in the desert for the Messiah to come and meanwhile living a celibate life, well, that's not a recipe for survival either. So 
They were just the followers of Jesus who followed a lot of the Torah, but not all. And the Jews, the folks that used to be called Pharisees, scattered throughout the world, who tried their best to observe the whole Torah, oral and written. Similarly, the New Testament for Christians expanded on the old. So why do we Christians still have the Torah in our Bible if it's not the central thing as it uh, is for our Jewish sisters and brothers? For one thing, it was Jesus's Torah. Jesus warns in the Sermon on the Mount, don't think I have come to replace the Torah. I have come to fulfill it. I have even come to exceed it. For example, he says, you have heard that it was said, thou shalt not commit murder, but I say to you, do not even get angry. You've heard the commandment, do not commit adultery, but I say, even looking at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. You've got the commandment. It's fine. It says, don't bear false witnesses, but don't limit yourself to when you're on the witness stand. Always tell the truth. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. And divorce and praying in public and fasting and taking vengeance, I am raising the bar, not abolishing it. When he healed the leper, he told the man, go show yourself to the priest. That's the teaching. That's the procedure in the Torah. So it's true that Jesus may have been more liberal than the Pharisees, but the Torah was still his Torah. Now, Paul might have probably wanted to disregard more of the Torah compared with Jesus, but Paul was turning Christianity into a mostly non-Jewish religion, which Jesus never got to do. Even more extreme than Paul was Marcion of Rome, who suggested that Christians ignore the Hebrew Bible altogether and its God, Yahweh. Marcion's scripture would have been 10 sections of Luke, 10 letters of Paul, period. Marcionism was, brand, uh, was branded a heresy in later years. Anyway, back to Paul. The food rules, the temple rituals, circumcision, these were the main problems for Paul, who wanted Jews and non-Jews equally welcome in the new church. But even Paul told the Corinthians, I don't care if you're a Jew or a Gentile, if the meat you buy in the market was butchered in a pagan temple, you can't eat it. It was sacrificed to idols. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. However, plenty of other Christians, mostly around Jerusalem, cherished the Hebrew Bible, the Torah. They saw in the stories, the Haggadah, if not the laws, the Halakha, they saw in those stories the foreshadowing of Christ. Think of the three mysterious strangers visiting Abraham. Maybe they were the Trinity. Think of Isaac stretched out on the wood of his father's altar. The parallel to Jesus is obvious. Think of Moses' outstretched hands ensuring victory just as someday Jesus would willingly do. And think of some of the prophecies in Isaiah and the Psalms, that beautiful verse, behold, her virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son and shall call him Emmanuel, God with us. So no, the Hebrew Bible was not scrapped. It became a treasure chest that future interpreters would search for hints of what would be coming. And especially in the Middle Ages, they found a lot of hints. Christians still keep the Ten Commandments but most of the other 603 laws they ignore, we ignore. Sometimes as in the case of the prohibition on men having sex with each other, they are quoted by conservative Christians. But then liberals ask, well, why are the other abominations on the list not so, are not even thought of? Eating shellfish, disobeying one's parents. Why are those ignored? The significance of the Torah. This is a hard one to sum up, but here's one attempt. I read an essay in college by Max Weber about the routinization of charisma. It's an awkward term that has nevertheless stuck with me for more than 40 years. Charisma, you might know, is a Greek word for gift, a special talent, an attractiveness, a new idea, and it often challenges authority. It can lead to revolution, which often means disaster. 
or charisma can lead to the next generation of followers. Think of those rabbis looking through their tears at the smoking temple or Paul's disciples watching his ship sail off into the West, the next generation would have to do it without those amazing leaders, without that amazing building. The next generation may not have spoken to God like Moses, but they still have his words. They preserve them. They create ceremonies and songs. They make rules for membership. They create customs that help people remember. They create routines that keep that temporary charisma alive. They stabilize. Routinization of charisma is necessary, but it isn't enough. Sometimes organizing a religion does the opposite. Sometimes it kills whatever it was that was so wonderful and special. Bureaucracy and church councils, belief statements, creeds, they start being what people focus on, not whatever the original charism was. I think our job is to routinize, but only if it helps to keep the gospel alive. The original gospel was charismatic, and our worship and prayer ought to make room for the living God. Otherwise, we've just got a clubhouse and a rule book and officers and procedures and that same tired rummage sale that we do every year. The genius of the five books of Moses is the mix of lore and lore, law and lore. It's got those vivid pictures of people I mentioned in the first lecture looking up and seeing something very exciting and important that we can't see because we're looking out through the window and they're outside. The rabbis taught that by living Torah, a person could maybe discover what they were witnessing. On Passover, Jews often sing a song called Dayenu. It means enough for us. The version I know has 15 verses and here's the first one. Ilu hotzi hotzi yanu hotzi yanu mi mitzrayim hotzi yanu mi mitzrayim dayenu, and then the chorus just repeats, "It would have been enough." Day dayenu, day dayenu, day dayenu, dayenu, dayenu. It means, it would have been enough if God had only brought us out of Egypt. It would have been enough if God had stopped after punishing the Egyptians. It would have been enough to give us manna in the desert and then let us figure the rest out, and so on. The last few stanzas give examples of how God drew ever closer to the chosen people, out of the pillar of fire, out of the pillar of cloud. God gave them the Torah and the land and the temple. And so, without a temple and absent living in the land, Torah is the way to be close to God, and it is more than enough.